The gospel lesson this morning continues from the gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter, the first 13 verses. It's been called the parable of the dishonest steward, a rather interesting parable that Jesus tells that ends by telling us that those that are faithful in little will be faithful in much. Listen carefully to these words from Luke's gospel. And then Jesus said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. And so he summoned him and he said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, and because you cannot be my manager any longer. And then the manager said to himself, what will I do? Now that my master is taking the position away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm too ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? And he answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. And he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. And then he asked another, how much do you owe? And he replied, a hundred containers of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with dishonest wealth, who will entrust you to true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. The little things... It's a strange tale, I think, not one that's easily understood. We know a little bit about dishonesty in our society. We've witnessed the, the fall of the banking industry due to simple dishonesty and greed. We're a suspect of most politicians and whether or not they can actually take office and remain above the inclination to pad their own reserves a little bit. Even our charities are no longer immune. How many times flipping through TV late at night have I seen Larry Jones and Feed the Children? Well, he's been relieved from his position with Feed the Children because apparently he was feeding himself a bit more than he should have been. So here we are at a time when dishonesty is on display most everywhere we're looking. We're trying to get a handle on how to avoid such behavior. And along comes Jesus with a tale that seems to award that very dishonesty that we're trying to avoid. On the surface, that's really the way the thing looks. But take a closer look. And it seems to be one parable in a long string of parables that Luke strings together about the issue of money, that issue that we love to avoid at all costs. What we make is ours, and what we do with it is our own business. That's a personal thing, we say, until it comes in handy to impress someone. In our culture, money is highly valued, without a doubt. But most of us would rather have a discussion, a frank discussion about the intimacies of our life than to talk about money in church. It's interesting to me, that, that's all. Listen to this parable again from a different source. 
from Eugene Peterson's translation, The Message. Obviously, as, uh, as he's put this together, he weaves his own understanding of the passage into it. But listen to how he tells this story. Jesus said to his disciples, there once was a rich man who had a manager. And he got reports that the manager had been taking advantage of his position by running up huge personal expenses. And so he called him in and he said, what's this I hear about you? You're fired. And I want a complete audit of my books. And the manager said to himself, what am I going to do? I've lost my job as a manager. I'm not strong enough for a laboring job and I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I've got a plan. Here's what I'll do. Then when I'm turned out into the street, people will take me into their houses. And then he went at it. One after another, he called the people who were in debt to his master, and he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he replied, a hundred jugs of olive oil. And the manager said, here, take your bill, sit down here quick, and write 50. And to the next, he said, and you, what do you owe? And he answered, a hundred sacks of wheat. And he said, take your bill and write in 80. Now here's a surprise. The master praised the crooked manager. And why? Because he knew how to look after himself. Streetwise people are smarter in this regard than our law-abiding citizens. They are on constant alert, looking for the angles, surviving by their very wits. I want you to be smart in the same way, but for what is right. Using every adversity to stimulate you to creative survival, to concentrate your attention on the bare essentials. So you'll live, really live, and not complacently just get by on good behavior. Interesting twist. The dishonest steward is praised for having smarts on knowing how to get by in the midst of a difficult situation. And Jesus wants us to do the same thing, but to do so for what is right, he says. Use the same tactics that you've seen this dishonest steward use, only use them for what is right. And then listen again to what Peterson says. Concentrate your attention on the bare essentials so you'll live, really live, and not complacently just get by on good behavior. So this morning, because it's the preacher's prerogative, I don't want to dwell on why Jesus seems to commend the crooked manager, and I don't want to talk about your money and I'm not about to approach any conversation about the intimacies of your life, but I do want to talk to you about the bare essentials, about the little things of our lives. And if you somehow extrapolate some message out of that that applies to you and how you live with your money and in the intimacies of your life and how you live as a Christian in church, well, then I'll be happy. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. You agree? Does that make sense? I hope so, because the little things, the very little, are what the bare essentials are all about. It's what we do with the little things, how we handle the details that gets us through the everyday mundane job of living life so that we might do it faithfully when the big stuff comes along, so that we might be able to handle what is large in life as well as we've handled what is small in life because we've done so and we've practiced and because we've trusted and had faith that it will be okay. If you can handle it with the little things, chances are you can handle it also with the big things, or at least you've got a handle to know where to begin. You've done it before. It's not a new principle. We use it all the time. When we teach our children responsibility, we don't begin at the top. We start at the bottom. When we made our first chore list at our house with all these kids, we needed some help, and if you're going to have six kids, you've got to put them to work. So we made our first chore list. But we didn't start that list with shampooing the carpet and dusting the china. We started it with, could you please pick up 12 years of Christmas toys that are lying on your floor and at least get last week's underwear into the hamper. That's where we began, with simple things about how you began to do the chores of life. And then as they began to get the picture, we moved on to more complicated chores and to more responsibility. And then one day they move away to college and they come home to visit and you see that they've forgotten everything that you ever taught them. Love you, Haley. <clears throat> 
and I still haven't cleaned your room. It's waiting for you. The first time we left the younger kids at home with the older kids, we didn't do it until we had observed how the older kids took care of the younger ones. We didn't just walk out the door and say, take care of your little sisters and brother. We watched to see how they had done, how they had acted and, and related with them in the little things before we left them all on their own. The first time we turned them loose with the car keys to go to the next town, we didn't let them get out on the road until we had seen how they drove in town. And then we knew how much we needed to pray when they hit the road to go out of town. And we issued a helmet before they left. It's the little things. How did you do on the little things? We ask it all the time. When you go for a job interview, they ask for references, and they check with those people because they want to know how it is that you in the past have handled the responsibilities you've been given. Have you been able to take care of the little things in order that we might give you larger things? And if you're moving up the ladder, it's particularly important that you be able to handle what you've been given so that you might be given more. That's the way it works. The little things. How did you do on the little things? We ask it all the time. We ask it all the time around here. The nominating committee currently is working hard, and we're almost finished with our task of putting together a slate of officers, of elders and deacons to be elected to serve three-year terms and to lead our congregation where God is calling us. And what questions are we asking along the way? The same questions you asked when you wrote down nominations for some of these folks. How have these folks done in the little things? If we want somebody to serve as deacon, have we seen this person be compassionate in the little things? Do they come to worship? Are they part of the life of the church? Do they treat us with kindness? Do they greet us with hospitality? Is this someone who in the little things has done well so that in the bigger things of life working as a deacon they might do well? We ask that question all the time. Has he done well in the little things so that we might give him more responsibility? We trust that there's a correlation between one's ability to handle the greater projects and one's track record on how one has handled smaller things. And Jesus is simply pointing out the same belief. If you can handle the smaller things of faith, you'll be able to handle the greater matters of faith. That's why you practice on the small things. And he believed it worked in faith matters, just the same as it does in life.